Okay, so we're now recording, and this is, again, a research and applications webinar from UNCG Libraries called The Psychology of Misinformation by UNCG Libraries Information Literacy Coordinator, Jenny Dale. All right, thank you, Sam, and thanks to all of you for coming. I'm really excited to talk with you about this topic today. Um, so again, as Sam said, the title of my webinar today is The Psychology of Misinformation. I am Jenny Dale. I use she, her pronouns, and I am the Information Literacy Coordinator here at UNCG Libraries. And I'm also a liaison to a number of different programs and departments, including the ones that you see on the screen here. So I'm co-liaison to AADS, liaison to classical studies, communication studies, English, media studies, and women's gender and sexuality studies. Now, the reason I lay all those out there is just because pretty much, I can't think really of an exception. I've worked with pretty much all of these areas to talk about topics related to information literacy and specifically to misinformation. So one of the things that I think is important to keep in mind as we're talking about things like misinformation is that it's really applicable across like all disciplines, all sort of walks of life, all different ways that we uh, engage with information. So I like to just bring this up here and say that I think misinformation and our knowledge about it applies pretty widely. I am not, here's who I'm not. I'm not a psychologist and I'm not a cognitive scientist. So I'm really coming at all of this through my lens as an information literacy specialist. And information literacy is the set of integrated abilities encompassing the reflective discovery of information, the understanding of how information is produced and valued, and the use of information in creating new knowledge and participating ethically in communities of learning. And I see implications for the psychology of misinformation all over the place in this definition. I think it's really important for us to be aware of how the psychology of information or misinformation impacts the way we discover our information, the, the sort of uh, different systems and different approaches that are at work there, the way we understand how we get information, how it's produced, how it's valued, how it comes to us. And of course, these kinds of psychological topics relate to how we create information as well. So I do have these slides available and I will pop the link if you want to follow along. But I also say that because I have a lot of content that I'm planning to cover. Um, and I also have lots of links here and lots of references at the end of the slideshow. So if you find yourself being interested in any of these topics and wanting to read more, um, I have tried to provide as much context as possible. Before I start talking about some of the psychological sort of concepts that are really at the core of this, I do want to make a distinction between misinformation and disinformation. I hear these used pretty interchangeably, uh, especially in the media when people are talking about these concepts of false or misleading information or fake news or deep fakes or any of the applications that we see of these concepts in our sort of information ecosystem. But the really important distinction is that um, misinformation is is wrong or misleading information as we see here in the Oxford English Dictionary definition, whereas disinformation, the big difference there is that it's deliberate. So disinformation, um, according to that same dictionary, is the dissemination of deliberately false information. This definition, I think, is a little dated at this point because um, it says, especially when supplied by a government or its agent to a foreign power or to the media with the intention of influencing the policies or opinions of those who receive it. So this uh, for first recorded use of disinformation in the Oxford English Dictionary is uh, 1955. So in 1955, I think this definition was probably pretty spot on. But when we think about disinformation now, uh, that dissemination really doesn't rely on a, a huge institution like a government or a government agent um, or, you know, the media. It really, we can spread and people do spread disinformation uh, easily through social media and through other sort of sharing platforms. So I think it's important to know the distinction here. Really, the to me, the key thing is that idea of deliberateness. Disinformation is something that is as it's wrong or misleading information that's put out there on purpose. And there are also some um, it, 
like sort of media literacy, news literacy specialists who also talk about uh, the concept of harm being important here, whereas misinformation may not be intended to be harmful, typically disinformation is meant to harm a person or uh, a political campaign or, you know, et cetera. So I just want to make that distinction here. I think of disinformation as kind of falling under the umbrella of misinformation. Um, so I like to use that broader term, but um, so that just gives you some context for going forward. So the psychology of misinformation, really at the core of it, you see I have my, if you're, if you're a fellow X-Files fan, I have my clip of Mulder's I Want to Believe poster from the X-Files. Um, really at the core of it, we want to believe things. Um, and when we think about why we're vulnerable to misinformation in particular, there are just there's years of psychology and cognitive science research that really indicates that at, at its most basic level, our brains just they just want to do the least amount of work they can do in a given situation. Um, not that they are some sometimes people call this sort of like lazy brain theory. Um, it's not necessarily about our brains choosing to be lazy it's about our brains making some decisions for us about what they want what they want to concentrate on where their attention and where their effort needs to go because there are a lot of automatic things that we experience in our day-to-day -day lives but as we have a higher and higher concentration of information available to us uh, our brains have done a lot of work to kind of create some shortcuts that we can use, and we're going to talk more about that. So these are some of the concepts that I'm going to cover. Um, cognitive miserliness, one of my favorite terms forever now. Um, system one and system two thinking, concept of heuristics, confirmation bias, and then two related concepts that we can kind of tie to confirmation bias, identity protective cognition, and motivated reasoning. So the term cognitive miserliness is, again, from the field of psychology, two psychologists, Susan Fisk and Shelley Taylor introduced this. Uh, and they say a cognitive miser is um, anyone who seeks out quick, adequate solutions to problems rather than slow, careful ones. And this next bit here to me is really important, that this sounds negative, right? It sounds like, a, you know, when I think of misers, I think of like Scrooge, right? Like people who are like, mean and like tight-fisted with you know their time or their money um so it sounds bad um but but it's really as they say here a term that describes our general tendency like as humans to rely on mental shortcuts to make our judgments and to draw inferences about things and this connects to what is sometimes referred to as system one slash system two thinking um which uh has been again explored by many psychologists uh, and is often called dual process theory. Um, and that posits that there are sort of two basic ways we do our thinking. Uh, and they're often presented in sort of binaries or labeled as binary. So you might hear about automatic versus conscious thinking, implicit versus explicit thinking, fast versus slow thinking, or as I tend to rely on system one versus system two thinking. And Daniel Kahneman um, wrote a book, I, I keep wanting to say a couple years ago, but I think it was like 2012. So I think it's close to 10 years ago now, which is kind of wild to me, but it's a book called Thinking Fast and Slow. It's kind of a popular psychology book. And he talks quite a bit about this concept of fast and slow thinking or system one and system two thinking. And here's how he's defined system one and system two. And this aligns probably the most closely with how I think of these. System one operates automatically and quickly with little or no effort or sense of voluntary control. And system two is all about, as it says here, effortful mental activities um, that require some sort of, again, effort for us. And I like this note here from, from his work that says that we uh, often associate the system two thinking with times when we feel like we're experiencing agency choice and concentration. So really the big thing is when we're thinking about system two, we're thinking about, okay, I'm taking a moment and I'm gonna think about this. I'm gonna deliberate on it, or I'm going to be um, careful and devoting my attention to this. Whereas system one, you know, those are all the automatic voluntary or involuntary things that kind of happen to us throughout the day. One of the ways that um, system one thinking can sort of come into play is, 
uh, through the use of heuristics. And heuristics are, they're basically mental shortcuts is how I typically think of them. Um, and they're indicators that we use to make quick judgments. And I have a link here, and again, you'll have my slides, um, but there is a great series from First Draft News, which is an organization that does a ton of great work on misinformation um, and disinformation, but they have a series called The Psychology of Misinformation, which is three parts. It's why we're vulnerable, why it's so hard to correct, and then kind of what we can do. So in this case, um, Tommy Shane, the author of that, this particular article talks about heuristics being, you know, something that we really need to rely on because they're easier and they're faster than like doing complex analysis of everything that we come across. So in the context of information, we need to have some heuristics that we rely on that we, you know, that we can draw on so that we're not just completely inundated and overwhelmed by the amount of information we come across. So an example, and this is a heuristic that I hear from a lot of um, my students, an example of a heuristic in the field of information is students always tell me that they think that peer reviewed journal articles are better than non peer reviewed journal articles or better than popular sources. And that's a heuristic they've built. And part of that is because they've been directed that way through assignments while they've been here in college. Part of it is because it's easy to build a mental model around this idea that this one particular type of source is the best source to use in all situations. So the problem that we have with heuristics of all kinds is that, of course, there's, there's never a general rule that's always true, right? There's always gonna be exceptions. So we have heuristics, um, they can end up leading us sometimes to incorrect conclusions. And for many of us who are here today, just, just from the folks that I know, many of us grew up or came up or were educated um, sort of in a different kind of information environment than what our many of our traditional age students are in now. So some of the heuristics that we've developed are not gonna be the same heuristics that maybe our students use. Um, so when, when I think about the way I learned to use journal articles, for example, I used a journal article that was in print in an issue of a journal that was bound up in a book, right? So I had this sort of mental, um, I had these different heuristics about the way I used journal articles. Now, because we do so much of our accessing online, a lot of things end up being stripped of context. So I have professors ask me sometimes like, you know, why are my students always citing JSTOR as the journal title? Or why do my students think that Taylor and Francis wrote this article when they're actually, you know, the, uh, that's actually the publisher. Okay, cool. This. Thank you. Okay, awesome. Sorry. So this is something also that we won't get into this, but um, this also relates to the a concept of container collapse, which is again, um, like, if I am just now learning how to use journal articles and all I see are journal articles online, there's no container in the same way that there used to be. And so it's harder and harder to kind of see, um, you know, the characteristics that we would have been able to rely on in the past. So um, anyway, heuristics, mental shortcuts, we rely on these all the time, not just for information um, related purposes, but for, you know, all kinds of things that we need to do and decisions that we need to make. And this is part of the effort we, we do put in at the sort of on the front end of that system one thinking. Confirmation bias, this is probably the sort of psychological topic I hear most discussed when it comes to information and misinformation. Um, so this is, I am sure many of you are familiar with this, um, it's that tendency to believe information that confirms our, what we already believe. But also, and the second part to me is really important here, but to reject information that contradicts it. So not only are we kind of like more willing to believe information that confirms what we already think or do or feel, we're also likely to reject information that's contradictory to that. We're trying to, again, sort of reduce friction. Um, and this is, is where some, some of our, it happens in that, again, system one thinking, um, because we, you know, we're seeking out the things that we like, basically. Um, and Shane notes that disinformation actors can exploit this tendency to amplify existing beliefs. It's important to know that um, disinformation actors, uh, people who are engaged in propaganda, whether it is, you know, something we would see as positive propaganda or negative, 
or somehow neutral. Like these people are all very well versed in the way that these different psychological concepts play out. So they know a lot about how to sort of potentially manipulate people. Um, and confirmation bias is one of the ways that we see that coming out. Now, there are hundreds of different cognitive biases, many of which can impact the way that we engage with the information that we come across. But confirmation bias, again, I think is the one I hear the most about that comes up the most often um, when we are talking about information that I hear in the news, that I hear uh, you know, other faculty members, other librarians talking about. So I think it's a really important one to keep in mind. So um, I will give you this example, confirmation bias in action. Um, it says here, if I'm a regular coffee drinker, I am a regular coffee drinker. I love coffee. I drink it every day. It's part of my routine. I get a headache if I don't have it. So if I'm a regular coffee drinker, and I know this is kind of small, um, which of these results do you think, if you can see them, do you think I am likely to be drawn to? And you, there can be more than one answer here. And actually, there's kind of a, a hint because uh, you might be able to see color differentiation indicating which one I did click on. Um, but if you will share in the chat, which just of these different sources, nine reasons why coffee is good for you, <laughs> for sure, I went right to that one. I was like, that sounds good, but also it's from Hopkins Medicine. So I think it's probably really solid. Um, first option, coffee sounds good for you. Some of these top stories down here also are all about coffee's benefits. I don't think that that means that every source that has come out has said that coffee is good for you. I think there's something else at play here that has more to do with um, with the algorithms behind our search engines, which is a whole different topic than what we have today. But these are things that, um, you know, these that's a way that actually the psychology of information or misinformation kind of seeps into uh, our systems, right? Because if Google knows that I tend to click on articles about why coffee is great, and it knows that that's typically what I'm seeking information about, it's going to serve me up that kind of information because it wants to make me happy and it wants me to keep coming back and googling stuff so again different different topic than what we're covering today but it's hard to untangle all these things but what if we're talking about something that's that that cuts way deeper than my coffee habit something you know i love coffee again it's something that i really rely on i don't consider like coffee drinker to be my like primary identity category it's not something where i think um if I didn't have coffee, who would I be, right? So when we think about, when we come across these things that might be more sort of tied to our identity, to our values, to our really core beliefs, that's where um, things start to get even, you know, a little more complicated. So I have some uh, headlines that I'm gonna show you here. The first one is one of my favorite ones to show in classes, which is study finds college men are lazy and shiftless compared to college women. And when I show this in classes, you know, any, students who identify as uh, college students who identify as men are like, oh, I am offended by this horrible uh, accusation. Whereas a lot of the women are like, mm -hmm, I see it this way. And of course, there are also limitations here, right? That's a binary that's being presented, you know, but just the very sort of the very idea of this uh, headline is going to have is going to spark emotional and psychological reactions in people. And, you know, that might be something that draws someone to it or causes someone to reject it, depending again on some of their biases. Here's one for some of us in the in the in the room today. Tenured professors make worse teachers. Again, if we as so I do have tenure. So when I initially saw this, I thought, I don't like that, right? I'm not interested in, <laughs> I'm not really interested in that. Um, I would probably end up, you know, reading an article like this, but my immediate reaction was, that sounds bad. It's not what I'm, it, it's not, you know, it doesn't line up with my experience. This one's for some of my librarian colleagues, library workers who are here, woke librarians take their politics to another level. Again, sort of attacking what we might see as our political beliefs as people if we I you know if we identify certain kinds of ways why women including feminists are still attracted to benevolently sexist men so again trying to spark a reaction from people who might uh, identify as feminists or people who think that um you know uh feminism is nonsense right again reactions all across the, the chain here 
Um, this is one of my favorite ones to use from the from our COVID times. Um, study finds sociopaths less likely to wear masks. So if you're a mask wearer, right, you see this and you think, yeah, I knew something was wrong with those people who won't wear masks. And if you're not a mask wearer, you're looking at it and thinking, um, this is ridiculous. I can't believe I'm so angry. I can't believe they're suggesting I might be a sociopath. Here's my favorite seven reasons vegetarians live longer. So I'm a vegetarian and unlike my, you know, daily coffee drink, like to me, being a vegetarian is, is really part of who I am. It's part of my, you know, my core values, what I believe in, how I live my life. So this to me is definitely like a part of my identity, being a vegetarian. And when I see headlines like this, I just immediately, I'm just happy, right? I see this and I think, I have made such great choices. I may live forever because I'm a vegetarian. Look at all this great, you know, data that I want to read. So my confirmation bias is at play there. But again, this is more, it's more than just, I believe vegetarianism is good. It's like, I believe it is good. And I have built elements of my life and identity around it. So when we talk about this, we're often talking about something that digs deeper, which is sometimes called identity protective cognition. Identity protective cognition, as Troy Swanson says, is it's about preferencing information, not just that we want to believe, but that connects with who we believe ourselves to be. And so this, once again, I just keep using this, this term like cutting deeper, but it's cutting deeper to who we are. And his, his sort of example here is this is why there are heated arguments about climate change, but not about gravity. Topics related to politics, religion, and race, among many other topics, are charged beyond simple fact-based analyses. And a lot of this is because we get defensive about the things that are related to our identities, to who we believe ourselves to be, to who we experience ourselves to be, and to what we really deeply value. So identity protective cognition and kind of takes things a little bit further. And then another connected idea is motivated reasoning. And this is uh, kind of dangerous. Uh, well, they're all kind of dangerous, but this is maybe particularly dangerous because this is when people um, do draw on that system two thinking, those deliberative reasoning skills, but they draw on those reasoning skills um, just to find information that supports what they already believe. So the idea we, we have when we engage in motivated reasoning is no, I'm being reasonable, I'm being logical, I'm looking for you know, evidence. Um, an example, just this sort of from my real life recently was I randomly saw one of those BuzzFeed lists that was like 25 things you need to like turn your home office into like the most beautiful space it can be. And one was a, a light therapy lamp. And for some reason, like in my mind, I was like this thing I need, I have to have this. And so I went out and looked for information about it because I wanted to be able to just support my own desire to buy one. Um, and I noticed as I was searching, even with sort of having this framing in mind, I was only searching for like light therapy benefits, you know, how light therapy helps, that kind of thing. So we do engage our motivated reasoning when we are spending time looking for information, but it's still just to sort of confirm and believe what we already want to believe. Um, so Penny Cook and Rand have noticed this. They're, these are two researchers who do a lot of great work related to misinformation and the psychology of it. Um, you know, they, they note here and they provide some evidence from other sources that, again, system two, that, that analytic level of thinking can actually exacerbate motivated reasoning in certain contexts. Um, so being like, you know, convincing yourself that you're thinking only analytically might, you know, lead people to use that reasoning to justify the beliefs uh, that they already hold. So we've just talked about a whole bunch of concepts. We just have a couple minutes left. I don't like to leave people on a negative, like, well, you know, look how messed up everything is. Good luck, right? I like to talk about what we can potentially do to reduce the impact of misinformation. And from the research that I have done on this, uh, really our most important thing we can do is just be aware of a lot of things. So first we can be aware of our own biases. Um, this slide and the next, they both talk about, um, they both refer to sort of countering or what does the next one say, breaking our confirmation bias. I don't think that we can really do that. I don't think we can say that I'm done with confirmation bias, but I do think that we can 
really kind of have a have a heart to heart with ourselves and talk to ourselves about uh, what confirmation biases we have, what's at play when we're looking for information, and to just sort of take a beat and think, how can I seek out additional information? Why am I rejecting this particular source? Why am I selecting this particular source? And, and just sort of having that awareness, I think, is really important. Um, practicing healthy skepticism. Uh, and what I've seen a lot in recent research is indications that in the US, many people have moved past skepticism and like straight into cynicism. Um, so we see research, especially over the past five years, indicating that like trust in many of our critical institutions, the media, journalism, education, uh, you know, democracy, uh, the government, that many of these things have like the, the trust in them has just plummeted. And so there are lots of people out there who have, who just say, I don't trust the, the media at all. I don't trust the mainstream media. I don't trust the news. I don't trust anything. And that's also not a healthy or productive way to deal with our information ecosystem, because then where is your information coming from? So skepticism is, you know, just being aware the potential for manipulation exists, it's out there. Um, and Shane talks particularly about emotional skepticism, being an awareness of your, like how you could be manipulated through your emotional or psychological responses. Um, there's a great video that I can add to my slides from Claire Wardle talking about this in a COVID-19 context. And she's she did this video about emotional skepticism like May of 2020. So, you know, still pretty early, lots of questions, lots of stuff. And she's, you know, she mentions that pretty much at that point, everyone in the world was scared in some way. And that when we're really scared or when we have other strong emotions, you know, beyond fear, joy, rage, all these kind of things, when we have those emotions kind of flowing through us, it's hard to be critical. Uh, there has been uh, some, some research that indicates that just like by being aware that misinformation can have a negative effect on you, that has almost like an inoculative power. Um, and there's the research on this is really interesting. And a lot of times it's about a specific sort of incidence of misinformation, but it does seem to suggest that if we just know, hey, there's misinformation out there, I gotta be aware of that. Again, just that level of awareness is actually something that can be really um, helpful for us. We can practice our system two thinking. Um, uh, this is one of the more recent articles that talks about this. Um, and they indicate that they did a study where they had people look at the veracity of headlines. And what they found was that when people engaged system two thinking, when they deliberated, um, they were less likely to believe false claims. And it didn't matter what whether or not it had to do with their ideologies or their beliefs. But we don't want to practice, also mentioned in the same article, motivated system two reasoning, MS2R as they call it, um, which is where, again, we engage in this deliberation that is only meant to protect what we already believe and, and to protect in this case, they talk about political identities. Um, so the this is a great source and I'll just, it, this is in the slides. Um, motivated reasoning. It's sort of a blog post basically from psychology today, but they talk a lot about what you can do like step-by-step step to help help you kind of move through a motivated reasoning approach and, and try to avoid it. So to sum it all up here at the end, really, I think the most important thing you can do is practice metacognition or thinking about your thinking. Slow down, be reflective. Um, I One of the things that I literally do, this is not just something I suggest to people, is that I do take a deep breath after I see a headline or if a claim or a social media post or whatever, I take a deep breath if I'm having an emotional reaction. And then I move on to use some of my strategies for evaluation. But really, again, as you've seen through some of the things I've cited in these last few slides, awareness is critical. And to be aware um, of our biases and of the effects of misinformation, again, we need to be reflective and be sort of thinking about our thinking. Okay, I was only a little over. That's pretty good for me. So uh, my email address is here, uh, jedale2 at uncg.edu. Um, and I know that some people may have to go, but so please feel free to email me later if you have questions, but I'm also happy to answer questions if people are here and able to hang out. 
And I dropped many links in the chat, sorry, but there's an assessment in there. There's a sign up for the next webinar um, coming up on April 7th at 11 a.m. Public opinion polling the basics. Um, so check that out um, and ask questions away. Penny, I have a question. Are there um, strategies or um, I guess maybe links that you could share where if 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 you have people that are close to you that are down the miss or disinformation rabbit hole how you can help them yeah so this is think about their thinking <laughs> this is such a this is such a great question and pretty much anytime i um either teaching or presenting about misinformation this comes up right which is you know concerning right that we that we have these situations and i have them myself personally. Um, I think that one of the, I do, I'm thinking of a couple resources I have saved somewhere that I will be happy to send you, Elizabeth. Okay. Um, but I, you know, I think what's hard is that so often that's when we get into that identity protective cognition and then we're feeling very strongly. Um, and then we're likely also to feel attacked by anyone who we see as questioning us or, um, you know, not taking us seriously. I think often um, building, you know, having a, a relationship that is built on trust helps with that, but it doesn't just like make it easy, right? It doesn't make it so that, oh, I, you know, you're a family member, I trust you. So I will, you know, take in, they take this into account, right? Typically, again, we see people being really angry um, when they feel confronted by this. Um, but I do, yeah, I have a couple, yeah. I, I think Melody mentioned in the chat, wondering if, you know, this, that we keep trying to battle it with intellect. And for some, for some folks, they just see that as just further evidence that we're part of a, you know, like liberal academic conspiracy um, about information that ends up being unproductive. But, I, you know, I think this is getting harder and harder. Um, it's It's been really challenging for me um, during, during this pandemic to try to, to get people um, who I love, people in my family to understand you know why why we can rely on science in these kinds of times and not not other sort of methods but i will look to see what i have and i will be happy to to share anything with you and if i have if i come across anything else i will also do the same and melody um also puts in the chat i like the tips about taking a deep breath and reflecting on the emotions we're feeling yeah, I think that one is kind of going back, like you said, Melody, in the comment before that, you know, I think that um, I definitely let me let me just grab the link to that Claire Wardle emotional skepticism video because she she explains this really well. Um, the idea that we think we can just uh, rationalize our way out of things that we can somehow disconnect from our emotions is like pretty ridiculous to think about right we just we 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 don't like suddenly become robots um so i'm just going to paste this in the chat and i'll also add it to my slides but this is where she talks about the need for emotional skepticism um and and it really her her suggestion is is similar to what i've said and to what lots of people say which is slow down um, because a lot of the, especially when it comes to sharing and disseminating myths and disinformation, uh, a lot of it happens because we don't slow down before we consider sharing. Jenny, I, I feel like, you know, sort of the, I, I, this sort of makes me think of kind of sort of extreme cases of like people who end up in cults and stuff and how, uh, you know, sometimes these are like perfectly mentally sound people who you know otherwise would be considered intelligent like you know they have degrees and whatnot but um how it really relies on uh emotional manipulation and identity to to like get folks into that and then like you know there's always the stories of people who come out of cults who are like yeah everyone like all of my family and friends were like no here's the rational xyz reason why <laughs> this is not okay but like like they can't they just can't see it until they're out of it 
Uh, and I know that's like an extreme example, but I do think that uh, the sort of um, emotional manipulation of uh, disinformation um, does kind of have that impact where you're like, no, that, you know, here, you know, when you try to like fight it with like, like facts or reasoning or like, you know, it, it doesn't matter at that point. Um, if they're not willing to uh, see it, then they're not going to see it, you know? Right. And then we see that same kind of resistance, um, you know, it's with the, like bringing, coming back to like cynicism versus skepticism that's it. Yeah. Oh, well you just, you know, you just got that from the, from the mainstream media and we can't trust the mainstream media. They've been lying to us all this time. Right. And so we build these, um, Shelby Webb, um, our diversity resident librarian and I presented about this and I really liked this phrasing that she used in talking about motivated reasoning. She said, these are like our mental gymnastics that we perform when we are trying to um, oftentimes, you know, sort of justify something to ourselves. Um, but that is something that happens in these kind of conversations too. And like, I mean, Melody, like you said, the cult example is obviously like a very extreme, but we're once again talking about when we talk about cult leaders, for example, people who are absolute pros at understanding the psychology of other people, right? They know exactly what needs to be done to manipulate certain kinds of people emotionally. They, and they know exactly what kind of information has to be provided to be compelling um, to, again, to people who might be vulnerable. I don't actually think the cult analogy is that extreme anymore. I think that's actually exactly what's going on with a lot of people. It is like they're in a cult about their beliefs about vaccination, for example. Yeah, I mean, we see, you know, there, along with the the research that's been done about, um, you know, our super steep decline in belief in some of our most sort of formerly treasured institutions in the United States and other Western countries as well, we are seeing so much research that really bears out the like polarization that most of us like see on a day to day basis, right? That this idea that maybe we are like, living in different worlds based on the information that we see and believe and bring in um, to, you know, to our practices. Okay. Any other questions or comments? Put in my email address in the chat in case anybody does want to reach out to me. And I know, let me put the, um, uh, let me put my slides back in there. I know Sam will also send this out. Yes, but. I have the slides next to the guide to remind myself to uh, do that. I'm grabbing your slides. Well, and actually, so maybe, yeah. I, I did it. Okay, great. Yeah. I was like, well, I don't want to mess up all of these, <laughs> all of these wonderful links that are already here. Um, um, okay, so are there any other questions? Okay. Well, thanks, Jenny. I enjoyed this. Oh, thank this. you all. This was thanks great. Thanks you all thanks for coming. coming. Have thank a great you. Friday. Great weekend. We're we're make we're gonna make it. It's great. Um, see y'all. Bye. Bye.